WESN. And I, when you said it, I said, ah, oh boy, I said, this man understand this thing. Because that is something we also miss, right? Because we are so locked in, and this is not an attack on systems or anything, so, because you must have procedures, you must have structures, right? But we are so locked into this, like a box, like a bubble, that there is no wiggle room, mm -hmm. right? Because what that guy would have done because you would have had to be there for the whole entire experience he was totally shut down and for him to even attempt that is so important so we really have to create these spaces expand that box burst that balloon where these young people could realize hey i could still be me and participate you mentioned at the starting there are two guests joining us mm. when you all reached out to me last week I said, right, I will invite Isaiah John and Emmanuel Villafana. They have been with us for the past 10 years plus. They have worked throughout the, um, within our programs, whether it's in YT, RST, St. Jude's, schools, communities, throughout. They are, they, they, they are Roots Foundation. When I reach out to Isaiah, now they are youth. With Isaiah is 24. When I reach out to Isaiah, I said, Isaiah, the station wants us to come back. I want you and Emmanuel. This was Isaiah's response. Now empty mom. I and Emmanuel do enough interviews. Take some of the younger ones who you have coming on this morning. Mm -hmm. Now, I, and, and I'm saying, I like to use these as real examples because I could have said, hey, I is the boss. I in charge. Mm -hmm. I, told, I said, I want you and Emmanuel. Isaiah is Ruth Foundation created this space that Isaiah and others so comfortable that Isaiah could say, now empty man. Send, and he, he called names. He said, send so-and-so, they come in a little later. And, right, so once a youth could have that, could be like to use the word empowerment, it is abuse word, but we don't really empower the young people, you know, right? Or we empower them up to this level because the balance is for us, you know? The balance is for us. So, yes, society has a real responsibility and a role in our actions, not just what we say. Else we keep on having talk shots and something nice, either on the pulpit, on the, on, the, on the podium, or wherever we choose to get an audience, especially of young people. They have to see that words in action. Right. Well, Mr. Sowers, I'm curious to know, uh, you know, the example that you just gave uh, with uh, Mr. John, Mr. Villapano, uh, you know, it, it speaks to giving youth an opportunity to express their, their true thoughts uh, and, and be able to actually say, no, I disagree with this. Uh, and, and that's a good thing and a bad thing. There may be those who are watching and saying, well, that was disrespectful, as you said. Uh, the attitude you could have taken was, I'm the boss, you're supposed to be listening to me. So is there a fine line between allowing young people to express their true thoughts and opinions uh, and even make such decisions? Uh, there's a fine line between that and society's approach to thinking, hold on, that's completely disrespectful. We are not tolerating such. Why? <laughs> there's a... All of us grow up with this saying from granny, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. Mm -hmm. It's not what you do, it's how you do it. Yep. Right? Now, Isaiah's response was, no, nah, you, why are you doing that, boy? He said, no, nah, empty man. And it was true. If you go through our web, our um, YouTube channel, you will see, I, a matter of fact, Isaiah and Emmanuel have been the face of Root Foundation for years. Right? They were just 10 years plus, you know. Right? Emmanuel is 10 this year, Isaiah is 10 next year, right? And what he's saying is true. 
give the other younger ones who now come in that opportunity because yeah. you don't want those who who came after isaiah and emmanuel to feel now nah, because they already people already refer to emmanuel and isaiah as my children my sons the empty my sons you don't want the others who come in after the field now nah, boy there is a click and no click in roots foundation right every youth and adult every youth have a voice every youth have a space and they are going back to last week they must feel that they are a part of this organization the youth must feel they are a part of society you cannot want them to contribute to something they don't feel a part of let me real kitan we're not doing that <laughs> so why we want young people they must contribute to society they must give back but then they don't feel a part of well they will contribute to what they feel a part of and right now society is competing with gangs let me be real well, we, that, that... About, we have a hundred and something we could have five gangs in trinidad five alone but the entire society is still competing with those five gangs because this this place is where these young people feel a part of we could not be on the outside looking and saying, boy, there's a violent structure, there's a violent this. Whatever it is, they feel a part of. Mrs. Owazi, do you think that we have a, if this, you know, society is competing with gangs. We are competing. Is it, is it that we have a failing society or is it that society is failing others? I, I wouldn't. I, I, I wouldn't use terms like that or I even say we're going down a well, you probably at the top of the slippery slope, but I don't say we, I wouldn't think we're going down a slippery slope or we actually have failed society. You know we, we when I, when I look at that definition of a failed society, we, we are thank God we are not there. But we are failing some in society. So okay. you're correct. We are failing some, right? And listen we we have to do better we have i told you before we started that, that interview last week sparked some serious conversations even conversations of frustration because people have, i always have conversation with my colleagues meaning others in the ngo world or who do any work we're doing and people are getting frustrated because they are saying in most cases, the business community not supporting the work we are doing. Yeah. And in other cases, we are asking the government, let us support you. Because the government is doing a lot, but we on the ground, you know, we can reach further, right? Last week, the Ministry of Youth Development and National Services had Youth Week, an amazing week for young people it ended with a spectacular um competition right i went through one or two days and i saw a lot of young people but you would know the ones that need to really be there and they wouldn't really come out so mm. no people when i say or they always saying that you know they wouldn't come out they wouldn't come out they have things there for them and they wouldn't come out how will get them out mm. it's more than just posting something on social media is more than just listen it's a trust issue to it it's a trust issue because i invited a young man right he really wanted to come and then the rain fell you know and he said boy empty i stuck home and i understand right but in my intention i wanted to go for him because that way i would have unstick here you would have been unstuck right so sometimes you have to do it right i invited some young men from a community to a program all of them said yes to come in i went up the morning to pick them up when i went up i saw one well dressed ready to go i said where them fellas the boy i told them coming out to know and i took that one and he stayed until he graduated from the program right but interestingly the last day, no, he made the hours, but the last day they had an assessment, and he called me and said, 
I have a diary. I don't know how I get this diary. And I understand what's going on with him. That is fear. Because in the mind, he's saying, boy, it's a test. Right? I go he get trauma going back to school days. But he still graduated. He, he made the hours. Right? The, the contact hours. And for the graduation, he called me. And they are, hello, they are 30 something year old man I'm talking about. Eh? They don't know you, you know. A young man called me, empty man. You have to come to graduation. I said, boy, tired in no reach room. No, 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 no. Because he wanted to celebrate this milestone with somebody whom he looked up to. And somebody said, boy, it's because of you. No, I'm not saying that you, Kitan, the Prime Minister, everybody have to do that. But guess what? You have the NGOs on the ground who are doing it. So we need the government to work with us. And we need the private sector to end, end, endorse us with their funds. Don't just put on the news how much profit you make for this year. You know, Put some of that back on the ground with the hard targets. You're already working with the soft targets. Right? Let us make these young people feel they are a part of this society. That is all the same. Well, Mr. Um, uh, Sowasi, how does uh, the, the two points I want to get into before we take our break? Uh, and the first, the first is, how does one build trust and confidence in an individual who has been exposed to vulnerable situations? Not a vulnerable person, as you corrected me last week, but somebody who's at risk of vulnerable situations. How does one build trust and confidence to someone who has been exposed their, their entire life to these situations? Very good question. And in building that trust has nothing to do with the individual. It has to do with you. Kitan, I always say, we as adults, there's no one people mama guy in us. Watch out them. They just talk. Him, him, him. So why we feel we could mama guide them? Why do we also feel that a person who is in an underprivileged situation, uneducated, right? I have to always quote this gentleman because I that helped me to to that helped to reform me to who I am in, in, in a large part. Right? And the deceased father Pantin, Jerry Pantin, said, he called it the gospel according to Silver. Respectful intervention. Right? We always feel we I know how to solve your problem, but they know how to solve the problem, they just got the tools. So you have to intervene respectfully. Lack of cultural arrogance. We like to say, when I was small and you know, the time different, boy. You think different now, right? Yes, it had peer pressure back then when you were small. But look at the peer pressure now with online. So is the world joining in to give you peer pressure? So don't talk about when you were small. Lack of cultural arrogance, right? Attentive listening. You don't just listen with your ears. And as parents, you know, you have to listen with your eyes. Because body language speaks louder than what comes out of the mouth. Right? And the philosophy of ignorance. As soon as we come to university, we feel we're real bright. So we know everything. You don't know nothing because you're, you're not living my life. I don't care what book you read. I don't care what theory you come across. A guy and us had a big falling out for that. Right? Because my young people on the ground working, you come with theories. Hello, they on the ground working, boss. Well, all they, all they, they, they don't know what they're doing. All they teach you is theories, though. It's, it's, <laughs> well, all, they, all, all they teach you is theories. But, but that's the thing with Solvasi, and I'm glad you, you know you responded the way you did. It leads perfectly to the to the second you know area I wanted to get into: removing stigmas, because we often, as you just mentioned feeling, thinking. I need to start feeling and thinking that these individuals are uneducated, are incapable, unwilling. Those are the stigmas attached to, uh, you know, you mentioned this uh, YTC, and, and there's this whole stigma. If he ends up in YTC, or if she ends up there, 
that's it. Yeah. You go to the potential of these individuals and exemplify it through poetry, through artwork. So then how is that, how, how do we now break that chain, that stigma? You, you spoke about, you know, uh, uh, cultural perceptions uh, and us thinking that we know everything. How do we go about now kind of intervening in our own mindset? That ah, Kitan, you realize it and I hope the nation understanding this conversation. It's not about them, it's about us. Boss, when I started to work in Y, when it, when it was YTC, I started to volunteer there back in 2005 or four, something about it. I had to reconfigure my mind. Firstly, I do not want to know what you are charged for. That is not important. What is important is what you intend to do with your life from now onwards. I always tell my boys and them in, in YTRC, I say, boys, I don't care what you charge for. What I care about is when you return to society, what are you going to do? Right? So it's about us. All these things, stigma is about our mindset, how we, because I, I always say also, how I view you is how I will treat you. Mm -hmm. And if I view you as a punk, I will treat you as a punk. But if I view you as, oh, this Mr. Keaton, a respectable person in society, I'm yes, sir, no, sir, okay, sir, thank you, sir, you're welcome, sir. Oh, so that is, the bomb too, right? Yeah, I'm not man, we want, you know. I will treat you how I view you. Society, we need to change our perspectives when it comes to certain groups in the society, as and especially where they come from. Oh. Right? We need to change our mindset. So this was a really important one. When I, there was a heinous crime that took place and two young boys were charged. And we are the public, you know, Kitan. When things come over the news, you know, we say, oh, hang them, kill them, this. Because we are wild, because we, we're scared, you know. Mm -hmm. As a society, we are scared, right? And when that act came up, I said, I voiced my opinion, bam, bam, bam. And when I went to, it was by this early time, the Friday, the superintendent, he said, Imam, come. I don't know where we're going. And I followed him. And he took me to this, um, this quarters. And two little boys stood up with attention. So I watched him, I watched him, the little boys. So I said, I'm trying to figure out, no, no, what's going on here? And then when I looked at the silhouette, I realized, oh my God, these are the two boys. And I turned to the superintendent and I said, but them is children? He said, this is what society needs to say. And I'm telling you here, tears flowed down my eyes because I was one said, to kill them, kill them, hang them, shoot them, this, that. But hurt people, we're not to the theories, hurt people, hurt people, right? You're not condoning that act that those two boys did, but find out what would have drove two young boys to commit such a heinous crime. And I worked with these two young men, but not only I, there are a lot of volunteers, there are the officers. I do single out myself because it could never be a one man. This is not um, Gotham is Batman alone. And no, this is, this is, this is real life. It takes all of us to make a difference in somebody's lives. I was just one of the individuals, or Roots Foundation was just one of the organizations that intervened in these young men's lives, right? And I would, I know we struck for time and stuff like that, but when, 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 when my lads leave, and when my boys leave in YTC, I just have a, a, like a party for them, I just ask them, where do you want to eat? I just challenge them. We want to eat because I know when you go and get when you go into the gallows, you have your last meal. So you go into the free world, you have your first meal. Because here why Kitan and here why nation. When somebody who is not conscious really return into society, hear what they do. They take off the clothes they have on because I blight clothes. So you put, right? They go down carnage and they take a sea bath to bathe off that blight. Change into the fresh kit. Eat a roti and copulate, you know, have some sort of intimate relations. If that is the extent of your freedom, 
you're going to go back in prison or somebody going to kill you while you're out here. So I asked my boys, where you want to eat? I remember a time one said pizza. I know the length of time he inside of there, he knows nothing about Pizza Hut. So I bought Pizza Hut with the, the um, cinnamon sticks. He watching it. Mr. M.D. Man, what is this? I start to laugh. I say, you're inside here too long. You call that breadsticks, right? So that is, apart from that, they have to do three things. They have to tell all of us, what did you learn whilst you were inside here? That is one. What life lessons? And the, and the, the learning is life lessons. What did some, so what, did, what life lessons did you learn? What did somebody say to you or what did somebody do that impacted your life positively? And the third thing is, what are your plans when you exit that gate? Because Kitan, if they do not have nation, if they don't have a plan, they're going to die on the streets or they're going to go back now into adult prison because they pass the age based on how long they were there. Yeah. What life lesson did you learn? What impacted your life? And what is the plan? Right? And we eat, they say that, and I told all the other lads now, tell them something positive. Now, this is why I stay control now, Kitan. Here was tell them, I don't want to hear freedom is a must, enough strength, hold it down. I don't want to hear them things. Tell that young man something that could carry him. One boy tell my time, Boy, Mr. M. Smith, I don't deal with you. I said, I don't care about that. You could still tell him something positive. And mm -hmm. he did. So that's how there's enforcement. Hey, I can see man in charge here. Yeah. So, <laughs> it could vary. Well, I'd say, what, Mr. Solvers, we, we're going to take a break because I want to welcome these uh, two other guests with us this morning. But there's something there very profound. Your last meal is when you go to the gallows. Yeah. Uh, but you are, you are instigating. Uh, that 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 sense of this is where my life starts. Your first meal in the free world. mean? You know? First meal. And Keaton, first... I challenge them. I said, tell me, they tell me they want oil. Whatever they, they ask for, I, I organize it for them. Because I want to show them we can deliver. So you have to deliver when you go outside here. We can deliver. Ask me what you want. Tell me what you want. You want steak, lobster, we bring it for you. <laughs> you have to deliver when you go outside here now. Yeah. And I'm very serious about that. Well, Mr. Solwazi, uh, let's take a quick break here on the program. When we return, uh, we're going to get into uh, some further conversation. Thanks for being with us, uh, and ladies and gentlemen. We're going to be right back after this. Welcome back to AM Prime, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for being with us uh, once more this morning. As we continue with our conversation, once more I'm joined uh, by Mr. M.T. Masolawazi. Uh, thank you very much for being with us uh, this morning, sir. But it gives me great pleasure in welcoming uh, two members of uh, the Roots Foundation, uh, TT. Let me start, sir, by welcoming Mr. Jaron Ruiz. Good morning, sir, and uh, welcome to AM Prime. Thank you for being with us. Uh, good morning. Thank you for having me. And uh, also uh, joining us is Miss Kelsey Brown. Good morning, Miss Brown. Thank you for being with us. Hi. Uh, good morning. Glad to be here. Well, let me start with you, Miss Brown, and, and uh, you know, ask you, uh, you know, what? How did you get involved with Roots Foundation, and uh, what is it that you actually do? What is the role that you think you have to play in the work and the efforts on the part of Roots Foundation TT? Right. So, well, I'm a spoken word artist. I've been um, doing poetry extensively for a couple of years now. And during the pandemic, that was 2020, um, Roots Foundation was hosting a poetry slam. And I entered the slam, made it all the way to the finals. And that is really how I got um, involved with Roots. That was my first, you know, real performance, real slam. Um, kind of setting and you know from there of course you know MT Mara kept in touch and you know he let me know about different things that Roots was doing and I was like yes this sounds good I want to be a part of this and since then it's you know just been getting involved wherever I can whatever they need me um, to do through my spoken word that's what I've been doing. What has Roots Foundation done for you and by extension what have you done for Roots Foundation? Um, 
Well, definitely they've, um, first of all, I would say they've helped me to travel. Um, I believe it was in 2021, around their roots, um, took a couple of us to New York where they were kind of piloting um, their festival, Cascadoo, in New York. So we did different workshops there, different performances. Um, and mainly what we do is, of course, bringing about social change and activism through um, oral traditions, so like spoken word, um, which is what I would do. So in terms of what I do for Roots, through my poems and, you know, whatever little workshops um, that they're hosting, I would, you know, come and try to, you know, bring about a bigger message in that sense. Well, Mr. Ruiz, thank you very much uh, for, for being with us once more. And uh, you too are a spoken word ambassador. Uh, and, uh, you know, from your standpoint, the power uh, of spoken word, what do you think uh, that power is? And uh, exactly what does that power entail in respect to the purpose of Roots Foundation? And for you as a, a youth ambassador, um, so spoken word for me is it's a it's basically a tool that one could use for social change. It's another another arm that you can go down that road if you'd like. Um, basically, it's a voice. It's giving a voice to to a particular topic, to a particular issue, uh, to a particular social change, and spoken word allows you to do that in basically basically a creative way um you know it's easy to go on a to go by a podium and say a speech but that might not grasp everyone but if you tell a story from somebody's perspective if you tell a story that grabs someone and a story that interests someone they they, they, they then begin to to hear it and look at it through a different lens um and could then therefore relate it a little better um in terms of spoken word with roots and what I think spoken word and where I think spoken word can be. Um, I think spoken word belongs on every stage. I think spoken word below should be broadcasted and air blasted, radio blasted everywhere. Uh, I think it, it needs to be, it needs to reach as many eyes and ears as it possibly could. Um, so that the message and so that the mission could be completed in terms of social activism and social change. What is, what is your mission in particular in respect to social activism? I mean, what are the things that you want to change or, or that you want to be a part of that leads to change? So for me personally, I am very steadfast in assisting with the Venezuelan immigration, immigration crisis in Trinidad and Tobago. It's something that I have been passionate about for the last I can't remember how many years I've been passionate about it for quite some time. Um, and it's something that I am passionate about because I do believe that Trinidad is a place where people should, we should be welcoming persons with open arms. And, you know, if, they, if they're looking for refuge, they're not coming here because they, you know, they're choosing to or because it's something that they want to do. They, they don't want to leave their home. It's something that they're trying to do for safety. And they come here for safety and end up, on the eyes of discrimination and prejudice and a whole bunch of negative stuff. So that is something that I definitely am passionate about assisting and making their lives better in any way I could. And in respect to helping fellow youth and assisting fellow youth, what role do you think you have to play in doing that? Just being a positive influence, just being a, a positive, uh, basically a model that people could look to and say, well, if he's doing it, I'm doing. It. I could do it as well. If he, if he's be, if he could reach on those stages, I could reach on those stages. If he could, if he could bring about this form of change, I could bring about this form of change. So stuff along those lines. I just want to be uh, a model and a, a role model, a good role model for for young persons as well. Miss Brown, uh, you know, coming back to uh, you know, I'm I'm trying to blend what what both you. And Mr. Reese have mentioned this morning, very, very similar, of course. Uh, and I'm curious to know, in your opinion, uh, what is a, a, a good role model in, in the era that we speak of, in the age and, and how society is now? What do you think is a, a good role model? What should a, a good role model be made of? Um, well, when it comes to being a good role model, of course, you know, you want to have a positive influence on others. 
Um, of course, we see, you know, the state that our country is in, especially when it comes to youth um, being involved in criminal activity, you know, being a good role model would be showing them that there is more to life than just that, you know, and showing them that it doesn't have to be the only way, despite, you know, circumstances, the situation that you're in, there is something more for you out there. So, you know, being a, a agent of positive change in that sense is about, you know, showing them. And I think through spoken word and other types of art, I think that's so important because I feel like art is very therapeutic for the soul. And I feel like if you can bring across a message to them in that way, I feel like that's a good way to be, you know, a positive role model on them and show them that there is more to life. I feel like that's most important because a lot of these um, disenfranchised youth feel like, okay, this is it for me. This is what I know. This is what I grew up in. So this is all that there is, for me. but it's not. You know? mm -hmm. Well, when you spoke about therapy for the solo, so Mr. Solo was, yeah, Mr. Reeves, the head shake. Uh, like like they synchronize that that head shake man. <laughs> so that, that that's good. It seems as though everybody is on the same page. But I'm I'm most pleased uh, to welcome Mr. Reese and Ms. Brown to the program this morning because I did ask Mr. Solo as he last week if we can have some of the artists come in and present their own pieces this morning. So I don't know if I'm putting you on the spot. I hope Mr. Solo as he told you, but I hope that uh, you guys can present uh, some pieces this morning, Mr. Reese. I'm going to give you the opportunity uh, if you'd like to uh, go ahead and, and start us off with your piece. Um, and you can tell us about your piece and, uh, you know, a exactly the meaning behind it. So if you'd like to start, the floor is all yours. Of course. Thank you very much. Um, I don't typically like to do a lot of speaking before my, before my pieces. I typically like to let my pieces speak for themselves. But um, funnily enough, my piece is on the Venezuelan immigration crisis that we are having in Trinidad. Um, I wrote this a couple of years ago, and it is kind of, it, it pains me to, to know that the piece is still as relevant today as it was three or four years ago when I wrote it. Um, but I'll just start and you'll, you should get the message. <laughs> These venues only come in for two things, we job and people gal. For real. That's what you feel. You think they had a big meeting before coming, like, okay, here's the plan. Us men go in and invade every and any supermarket and corner store. Women, to distract them, go knocking on every happy relationship door. We'll go in small numbers at first to make sure it don't look like an attack. But soon, the whole island will be named Venida. That's what you think happened, player. I mean, it's not like the country was under constant pressure and danger. It's not like if they walked to the shop and back, they could get kidnapped by random strangers. You have the facts straighter than any citizen or politician. You did the research and sniff out the Venezuelan secret mission. You found the truth and placed prejudice on anyone coming out of that nation. But what if I told you that that wasn't their true ambitions? What if I told you that these people just wanted a better life? What if I told you that they were tired of hearing wars at night? What if I told you that they had no brightly shining armored knights? And what if I told you that Trinidad was a beacon to their fading sight? Would your mind change? Or would you still say these people came because they wanted to? Let's switch the view. What if it was you? Trinidad became an outcast. Crime rates higher than ever and no neighboring countries reaching out fast. Gangs running rampant and you can't be out past six because that's when the sound of clips getting unloaded could be heard the most. But then on the western coast, you and your family board a boat to a foreign land. Suddenly there's hope even though you don't know the words being spoke, but it's better than the country you left because you could still smell the fire smoke from the riots that you saw firsthand. But then suddenly you turned into a joke and the people claim that you only come there for their jobs and people man. No, no, but they want to be better than us. They're not asking to be better than. They're asking to be equal to. They're not asking for you to hold their hand. They're asking for you to cut them loose from the shackles of racism and the poles of discrimination that you've tied them to. They're not asking for everything. They're asking to be just like you. But why should I care about how we operate now? 
probably because that's what this country was all about. We never sit back when persons were in need, and that's what made us stand out. We were the land of opportunity in the Caribbean. Something going on home, come, build a house. And it seemed like the people from the past could come and teach us a lesson now. African, Indian, Chinese, they were all here at the same time. Some came as slaves, but they made something out of their lives. Literal blood, sweat, and tears shared as they stood side by side. But now there's a divide. You have what's yours and I'll have what's mine. Venezuelans on some of it? Nah, take your time. You less than me, so go to the back of the line, right? How come you're going to be writing posts on Black Lives Matter on Facebook to liking and reposting Venny jokes? How are you going to be fighting a war in another country but want to go and... How are you going to be the problem in your own country but want to go and fight a war in another land? You don't see how degrading a whole nationality could cause us harm. Oh, gosh, stop it now. Nah. It's only when something happens to the venue who does wash your car or touch your parts is when you just want to be up in arms. And ladies, not every good-looking Venezuelan wants your man. If his head could turn so easy, then that was not your man. But that is fine, next boy. All I'm asking is that you give them a chance. I know they're not all good, but that doesn't mean that they're all bad. And again, I'm not asking for you to hold their hand. Just start by not belittling them and making them feel like they're lesser than. And one more thing for you to think about, and yes, I'm being generic when I say this, but why is being bilingual such a big thing, but being a Veni makes it basic? Strange. Thank you. I... Um... I'm not speechless because there were more, so many points there and so many emotions. I think that's one of the, the, the powerful things about spoken word. There's so many emotions that you feel at the same time that you don't know what to feel. You know, it hits you so fast, it hits you so quickly, you don't know exactly what to feel. When you spoke about people of the past maybe teaching us a lesson now, you know, it, it hits you differently. When you spoke about, uh, you know, they're not asking us to hold their hand but to cut them loose. You know, it, it speaks to everything that these individuals have faced. And you, you will never know it. You'll never experience it. But it really hits you so fast. Miss, Miss Therese, I want to thank you very much for that. And I'm curious to know, though, you said something before you started your piece. You said it's still relevant today as it was four or five years ago. Does that trouble you? Does that make you feel angry or hurt in any way? Not so much angry, just disappointed. Um, and it, it still fuels me with the same fire to, to, to still fight for the change, to still, to, still stand for, to still stand for what I believe in, basically. Not, still, not to get still, angry about it, but to, to, to keep pushing for change. It still fuels you. It still fuels you. Wow. The activism doesn't end no matter how frustrated you might feel it really isn't it let me come across now to miss brown and uh, i want to welcome you back miss brown thank you once more for being with us this morning and uh, you know if you'd like to do the same i don't know if you prefer to to speak to us about your piece or, or what you were thinking or feeling when you wrote it and then going to it it's, it's all entirely up to you miss brown the floor is yours yes yeah, so this piece that i'm going to do it is it's entitled an old to steal Pan. Um, what an ode is, it's, you know, it's a celebratory poem and, you know, last year we had, well, I think it was the first World Steel Fan Day, of course, we are still in August, so it's Steel Fan Month, um, and also, you know, the Steel Fan is now going to be on the coat of arms, which I think is a really um, nice thing for the country. I feel like, you know, sometimes we tend to focus a lot on the negative and this need to fix and that need to fix but i feel our identity our culture is something that we should also celebrate so this poem um i did write it a few years ago um i'm also a panist <laughs> so it felt very fitting and this is this type of poem what i intend to do with it every year around carnival you know new soca comes out new music comes out i try to include new lyrics um, from that kind of a season in it. So you just kind of get it. Yeah. Forge from the love of the unexpected sounds of abandoned oil drums. They bravely beat one man's trash into our treasure, the steel pan. 
Trinidad and Tobago's 20th century baby with humble beginnings it carried a bad John stigma on its strings synonymous with melodies and misfits. Hand playing and bottles breaking fellas fighting but music still making. Eventually, the pan crescendo to new heights its unlimited potential of being celebrated and recognized both locally and worldwide. It even made a debut on Google Doodle 2 as a panist. Proudly hitting those sweet steel notes, serenades my soul and bombards my body with feelings of euphoria that command me to dance and tingle it. Hey. Each groove in the pan brings out a rich history of our people who are just as unique as their instrument. Every harmony tells the story of our culture, the way we belt out our tales like tunes, how our humor is sharp but our personality never falls flat. In fact, it bounces on the laughter of a melody. The pan is so diverse and complex it can form its own orchestra, independent of any mother instrument to drown it out, unapologetic of the music it creates and unashamed to be Trimbegonian. And whenever Panorama rolls around, every pan is singing, we time coming back again. So whether you're in the savannah or the grandstand, it's our vibe in the session when we jam into the steel pan. Music doesn't discriminate, and pan is the same. Here, every creed and race find an equal place in the pan yard or rhythm section, so kudos to you, Winston and every other pan trailblazer who continue to create a legacy. You are the real. I am man, oh, the sweet man, when they lick the pan. And to you, the audience, I hope you get to taste our creation. I hope you get to hear pan in A minor and dip all of your senses in our culture. Let the steel pan make you rock and sway like tamule because Trimbego is pan. <laughs> You know, you, you sing, <laughs> you sing like that. And every time you, you, you spoke to the lyrics or you fused the lyrics of, of past clips, it was a surface. I'm hearing the steel band in my head. Because all those songs that you, you mentioned, those are panorama songs. You know, those are panorama songs. And, and that's incredible. But what a profound time, even more ever than now, to present this, where you said, Music does not discriminate, and every creed and race finds an equal place in a steel pan yard. And I think we tend to forget that. Uh, I think we really tend to forget that. Subtle but very powerful messages. Thank you very much, Ms. Brown. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Mr. Salvazi, I think, uh, I think really you've brought a sense of, of what our young people here in TNT have. Not only the potential within, but the work that they are doing to bring it out in themselves and in others. So, Mr. Solazi, thank you very much for last week. Thank you very much for this morning, and thank you very much for Roots Foundation. This has been an absolute pleasure, Sue. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. And I think, need I say, this is not the last time we would be seeing each other or speaking to each other. There's a lot more to be said and a lot more to be done. And yes. Ms. Brown, I thank you very, very much. We look forward to, who knows, maybe you opening Panorama in the not-too-distant future with one of your pieces. And Mr. Ruiz, your efforts are not in vain at all. So all that you may feel and all that you may think, good things will only come. Thank you very much. To WESN.